Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, recently I have been making and playing with a dye called fluorescein, which is the dye used in, for example, these yellow highlighters that everyone uses. It not only has a nice color, but it's also fluorescent, meaning that it glows a very nice yellow green color when exposed to UV light. I know that you are probably wondering right now what this green dye has in common with electric cables, and it actually has quite a lot because of the weird world of chemistry, and today, I will be converting one into another. But before I can tell you how I actually did that, I first need to give a little bit of an insight on how this is actually possible. Firstly, fluorescein can be made by the reaction of resorcinol with something called phthalic anhydride. The first ingredient is pretty hard to make, so I will just buy it from a chemistry supplier, but the phthalic anhydride is chemically pretty similar to a group of commonly used plasticizers called phthalates. These plasticizers are used to make various kinds of plastics softer, because on their own, they are pretty hard and brittle. For example, the very commonly used PVC or polyvinyl chloride plastic is normally pretty tough, and this form is used in for example plumbing, but after the addition of a plasticizer, it becomes soft and malleable, and is used in for example vinyl gloves. Gloves were the thing that I originally wanted to use for this video, and all that I had to do was extract the phthalate plasticizer and chemically process it into the phthalic anhydride. On paper, it seemed pretty simple, and in reality, it was probably too, and after learning about this procedure, I proceeded to do the extraction. What I didn't know was that phthalates have been removed from most consumer products a few years ago because of some toxicity issues, and finding gloves that contain them is nearly impossible in my country. The first gloves that I bought literally had a text saying phthalates free written on them. To this day, I don't know how I missed that, but after this failure, I still had hope for finding gloves that actually contain the phthalates. After a few days of searching, I found ones that didn't have anything written on them that might suggest that they don't contain the phthalates, and with lots of new hope, I decided to process them. I didn't record anything since I had done the whole procedure in my garage after coming back from school, but I managed to film the final result, which turned out to be bad to say the least. These gloves contained some kind of a white goop instead of the phthalates, which was a total pain to work with and gave no positive results. At that point, I didn't know what to do next, and I started to question my existence and chemical skills, but while staring at the floor, I saw some blue cable just calmly sitting there, and it turned out that it was the solution to all of my problems. You see, most cables have a layer of insulation, which is most often made from PVC, and it needs to be very flexible since, obviously, cables need to bend, and it just turns out that since cables don't come into contact with your skin too often, they actually can contain phthalates. While starting this project, I wasn't sure of that, and that's why I first wanted to try it with gloves, but I failed miserably, and now the cable was my only hope. The first step is to extract the phthalates present in the cable, and to do that, I need to take the insulation off the cables, because the copper would interfere with the process later on. I firstly wanted to use a professional insulation cutter that I have, but I forgot to bring it to my lab, and that was a big mistake. I now had to use my hands and a pair of scissors, which was very painful and incredibly slow. After about an hour of struggling with the insulation, I finally managed to get a considerable amount of it, along with a lot of copper that I plan to use in a future video. Anyway, the exact amount of insulation that I got was 55 grams, which should be enough considering that I only need a few grams of phthalates. For the extraction step, I have to grind the insulation, and for that, I originally wanted to cut it up using a pair of scissors and a coffee grinder which works only to some extent, because the insulation pieces were too soft, and the grinder just didn't seem to grind them too well.
After my trusty grinder had failed me, I thought that cutting the insulation with scissors would be a good idea, but after doing it for a while, my hands basically said no, and I had to think of something different. I fortunately found this brand new blender, which hopefully should be able to grind the insulation. To find out if it works, I poured all of the insulation into the blender and turned it on. It still wasn't perfect, but after a few minutes of grinding, I was left with some blue cable insulation gravel. Now it was time to extract the phthalates from it, and to do that, I just poured a good amount of isopropyl alcohol onto it. It will act as the solvent, which will selectively dissolve the phthalates and leave the plastic intact. I also tried to stir the mixture with a stir bar, but it was too weak and just ended up sitting there and doing nothing. I then placed a flask with some cold water on top of the beaker and turned on the heating. As the isopropyl got hotter and hotter, it started to boil and its vapors were condensing on the cold water flask and fell back onto the insulation pieces, which created an improvised reflux. It was also dissolving lots of diphthalates along with some of the dye from the insulation, which made the solution really cloudy. After about 40 minutes of refluxing, I took the beaker of the heat, assembled the gravity filtration apparatus and filtered the mixture. After the filtration, it was less cloudy, but for some reason it decided to turn yellow, which wasn't a good sign. At this point, I still wasn't sure if there were any phthalates present in the mixture, and to check that, I decided to proceed to the next step, which will hopefully reveal that there are some present. I know how to do something called a hydrolysis reaction, but before that, I decided to boil my solution down to concentrate it, and after that, I filtered it again to get rid of most of the junk. After that was done, I prepared a sodium hydroxide solution by dissolving about 20 grams of it in about 200 ml of distilled water. After all of it had dissolved, I slowly added it into my phthalate solution, which became even more yellow and separated into two layers. This was actually exactly what I wanted to see, and it basically confirmed the presence of phthalates in my solution, and from the volume of the upper yellow layer, I knew that there was quite a lot of them there. The reaction that happened here is known as an hydrolysis, and it just basically cuts the long carbon chains of the phthalate and replaces them with sodium ions forming something called disodium phthalate, while adding an OH group into the carbon chains, turning them into alcohols, that form a separate layer. To maximize the leak of the disodium phthalate, I could do a reflux, but I actually forgot to do that and just proceeded to the next step. I now had to separate the alcohol layer from the aqueous one, and to do that, I got my separatory funnel, and while double checking that the valve was closed, I poured in all of the phthalate containing mixture and proceeded to slowly separate the layers. I just needed the aqueous one, and I discarded the yellow alcohol mixture. Now, it was time to convert the disodium phthalate into phthalic acid, and that can be done by just reacting it with some hydrochloric acid. I didn't need to measure a specific amount of it here, but I rather had to get to a specific pH of about 1. After adding the first portion of the acid, the pH was still very basic, due to all of the unreacted sodium hydroxide present, but after the second addition, the pH was about 1 which was ok, but then I decided to add another portion of the acid for good measure. After all of the additions, there is way too much water around, and to remove it, I just boiled the mixture on my hot plate for some time.
After about half an hour, a lot of the water disappeared and some crystals started to appear. This was probably just some sodium chloride and to get the phthalic acid to crystallize out, I boiled the mixture for a few more minutes. After that was done, I put it into a fridge for the night and the next day, I now had some nice crystals on the bottom of the beaker. To get them out, I assembled my vacuum filtration apparatus and filtered them. After the filtration, they were still very wet and to dry them, I put them into the oven for some time. After about an hour of drying, I took them out and now they were nice and dry and ready for the next step. And speaking of that, I now need to dehydrate the phthalic acid into phthalic anhydride by heating the crystals to about 300 degrees Celsius. To do that, I got them into a beaker on my rusty electric stove, cranked up the heating and waited for something to happen. At first, some residual water started to boil, but after that, nothing seemed to happen. I was pretty disappointed because it turned out that the crystals are probably just some sodium chloride and they don't have any phthalic acid in them. After thinking for a while, I got to the conclusion that the phthalic acid must still be in the solution and thank god I didn't throw it out yet because now it was my only hope. I firstly wanted to lightly evaporate it in a beaker and when it dries, I wanted to crank up the temperature for the dehydration but before all of that, I had to pour the solution into a beaker. Here I made one of the worst mistakes in my chemical career so far and to this day I just can't believe I did that. I placed my beaker on a still very hot electric stove and proceeded to pour the solution straight into it. I for some reason didn't notice that the stove was hot and when I poured the solution into the beaker it broke but decided to not shatter everywhere for which I am very thankful but nonetheless it was a very scary experience and I still don't know why I did that. Anyway, in the second attempt, I was smart enough to place the beaker full of the solution on a cold electric stove and slowly increase the temperature until it started boiling. After some time, all of the water was gone and I was left with a white crust that hopefully contained the phthalic acid. To find out, I cranked up the temperature, put a flask of cold water on the beaker and waited for something to happen. Fortunately, this time some fluffy crystals started to show up and they were exactly what I wanted to see. I left the beaker heating for some time for more of the phthalic and hydrate to appear and when no more showed up, I turned off the heating and proceeded to scrape the crystals using a metal spatula. The amount that I got was suspiciously small and if I wanted I could probably get more but even a tiny bit of this stuff goes a long way. Anyway, now after a ton of struggling to make the phthalic anhydride, it was finally time to make the fluorescein. It shouldn't be that hard and all that I have to do is just to heat the phthalic anhydride with some resorcinol in the presence of sulfuric acid. To do that, I just got all of the ingredients into a small beaker and heated them with a blowtorch. The mixture quickly turned red, which was a good sign since red is the color of pure fluorescein. After the heating was done, I got a tiny amount of the product onto a glass rod and put it into a flask with some distilled water. Immediately after the addition, the wet color disappeared and instead the iconic yellow green color of the fluorescein started to appear. On its own it's pretty nice, but after I turn on the UV light, it starts to glow by itself, which is just beautiful. I won't go into much detail about why it does this, but long story short, the UV photons excite the fluorescent molecules, which release this excitation energy by emitting a photon with a lower energy, which just so happens to have a beautiful light green color. The intensity of this color can be modified by changing the pH, 
and to show it, I got three flask filled with distilled water, and I made one acidic with some sulfuric acid, one is just at neutral pH, and the last one is basic, because of the addition of some sodium hydroxide. As you can see, the basic one is by far the best one both normally and under UV light. Anyway, now I wanted to make a crude version of a fluorescent marker, and to do that, I got the cotton swab that I have soaked in my fluorescein solution. It isn't nearly as good as the commercial stuff, but that is probably because they use some other chemicals to boost the properties of fluorescein. Nonetheless, my improvised version is also pretty nice, because it once used to be just a cable, and it is just pretty special. Anyway, I wanted to do an experiment with the fluorescein, which was just a modified version of the classic elephant toothpaste, but I wanted to make it glow in the dark. I mixed up all of the ingredients, but instead of a beautiful green foam, I got this ugly orange mess. It turns out that the fluorescent reacted with something from the toothpaste and turned orange, which destroyed its ability to fluoresce. I will probably repeat it in the future with some luminol, but now to cheer myself up, I did a few slow motion shots of the fluorescent in water with a UV light, which turned out to be pretty spectacular. Anyway guys, if you made it that far, thank you very much for watching, like and subscribe if you liked the video, and see you in the next one.